Welcome to setting up, recording and managing oral history interviews, a training session developed by the Community Archives Skills Support and Sustainability Project, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. I'm Laura McCourt, Community Archives Project Manager. And I'm Robin Sampson, the Community Archivist for the project. By the end of this session, you will understand how you can plan an oral history programme, you will learn the basic procedures for setting up and recording an interview and the ethics around recording. You will learn practical tips for recording, editing, cataloguing and managing oral history interviews. An oral history is a recorded conversation, often in the form of an informal interview that focuses on the lived experience of an interviewee. It is a personal record of their memories and opinions. Oral histories can form a significant part of a community archive's holdings. Recordings can be made available for researchers as whole interviews or as selected excerpts and can be used on websites and social media or in publications, on heritage walks and be featured in community exhibitions and events. Oral history recordings are a useful complement to more traditional materials such as manuscript documents and photographs are usually found in an archive. They can be more immediate and emotive than the written record. They enable researchers to engage with history from below, the history of ordinary people, as well as history from above, the history of government, businesses and institutions. Oral history recordings can provide fascinating insights into domestic life, workplaces, societies and the development of local communities. They can also provide different perspectives on major historical events, such as World War II, as well as documenting important aspects of the present, such as the coronavirus pandemic. An oral history recording can capture a person's memories and opinions, provide information about profession, lifestyle, organisation or socio-political movement, or a geographical region. It can also capture a participant's voice, accent and dialect. It is important to set out where you want to collect oral history recordings, particularly if you are applying for project funding. Before you begin, establish clear aims and define your outputs. Questions to think about beforehand include, what are your reasons for running the program and how will you know if it's been successful? What kind of people are you hoping to interview and how many interviews can you capture, both with your current resources and with further funding? Have an idea about the length of the interviews you want to do and their total duration. Think about what you will do with the recordings. Will you use them in exhibitions or put them online? How will you provide access to the recordings, bearing in mind the recordings may contain sensitive content and personal information? Write down a statement that answers these questions. For example, your project aim could be to create a resource for researching your local village since 1940. Your outputs could be to record 20 oral histories covering a variety of community voices. You will use selected clips from the interviews in an online exhibition and the recordings will be available for researchers to access in your research space, with some sections being closed for sensitivity issues. You may also want to use extracts from the interviews in an exhibition heritage trail or as the basis of a publication or a series of blog posts. Some community archives choose to entrust the long-term preservation of oral history recordings and the provision of public access with an established heritage institution, such as the Norfolk Record Office. At the NRO, we can provide advice and support, including templates for participation and recording agreements. We will require completed copies of these. It is important to contact us as soon as you start to plan your project. We will confirm whether the recordings fall within our collection policy, the project outputs required, preferred file formats, and any supplementary material such as a list of items being deposited. We would also discuss ownership and copyright in the same way as any other collection that would be offered to us. Please note, if you are running a funded oral history project, let us know in advance as we would then charge a fee to cover the costs of processing the material and adding it to the NRO's permanent collections. Contact Northrec at norfolk.gov.uk for further information and advice. When choosing a focus for your oral history programme, 
it's useful to think about how the recordings will enhance and enrich your existing collections and whether they might fill in any gaps. Themes should correspond with the criteria set out in your collecting statement. This is a statement that sets out what your group are and are not interested in collecting. For example, you could focus on interviews that tell the story of your local parish or of a local industry, organisation or political movement. Planning this out will help you decide who to interview and where to advertise for interviewees. Don't always focus on interviewing elderly people. Look at recording a snapshot of the population's demographic. When looking for potential interviewees, try to be as personable as possible. Emphasize that you'd like to hear their stories and memories about the local area, workplaces and family and friends. It's a good idea to get to do direct contact as soon as possible and to start the process of building informed consent and trust. Avoid starting off describing the process as an interview, as this can be off-putting to some people. Have a project information sheet, which potential interviewees can share with loved ones to introduce your program and what you plan to achieve. This will help potential candidates understand the value of their contribution and help them feel more confident about having something relevant and useful to say. Here are some tips for getting in touch with people. Firstly, ask members of your community archive group to draw up lists of potential candidates in their local networks who fit the collecting criteria. Contact local history societies, boards of governors, clubs, parish councils, local schools, churches and any other relevant groups. Advertise to interviewees on social media, particularly community Facebook groups or local message boards. Put notices in local shops or on library message boards with your organisation's contact details. Advertise for participants through local newspapers or radio stations. It's important to be selective. You don't have to interview everyone who approaches you. Select participants who you feel will best represent your chosen topics. For those who you can't interview individually, you could host an event such as a reminiscence coffee morning to capture memories. Once you've confirmed your interviewees, you'll need to do some initial preparation before the interview. Do some background research about the profession, industry, organisation or other community so that you know which questions you'll like answers to and the topics you want the interviewee to cover. Your own collections may come in useful here. The group member conducting the interview should engage with the interviewee in all aspects of the interview process. Try to contact the participant via telephone rather than via email or letter to help build up a personal relationship. Set out the scope of your oral history project in a document that can be shared, including the topics you are interested in talking about and an idea of how you will structure the interview. This will allow the participant to prepare by finding diaries, photographs and other memory aids. If you're using memory aids during the interview, have mechanisms in place for borrowing, copying and returning these items. It's also useful to check if the interviewee has any specific insights due to their life and career. This will allow you to identify appropriate subject areas to research and focus on in the interview. For example, if you're doing a project in Norwich's shoe industry, someone who worked as a leather cutter will have different insights to the owner of a shoe factory. Suggest an interview location that will be comfortable for the interviewee. Many choose to be interviewed in their own home. Practical arrangements should be confirmed in writing and include who will be attending the interview, where the interview will take place, how long the interview is likely to last, and a contact telephone number in case the interviewee needs to cancel or postpone. It's important that interviewees have trust in you and your process for keeping and managing their recorded interview. Interviewees must make their own decisions about how they want their recordings to be used, shared and accessed. It is important to explain and acknowledge this. As an interviewer, you have a duty to ensure you have the informed consent of interviewees. At every step of the interview process, make sure the participant understands why they're being interviewed and how you plan to store and use the interview recordings and their personal information. It is useful to send the interviewee a crib sheet introducing the project and explaining the interview stages and what their rights are. Respect confidentiality. If an interviewee states that part or all of what they talk about should be confidential, that must be adhered to. 
sensitively suggest a closure period, which means that some content is not made publicly available until a specified time, for example, after the death of the interviewee. If the recordings are to be deposited with a professional record office, make sure the staff are aware that there are access restrictions in place. Ensure sharing an interview will not cause substantial damage or distress, for example, causing an interviewee to be vulnerable to identity theft. Keep a notepad handy during the interview so that if there's a potentially sensitive part, you can jot down the time code to review it later. Make sure you are aware of the legal basis for holding and processing personal information, including the interview contents and the permission forms. In terms of retaining an interviewee's personal data, the Oral History Society advises relying on the legal basis of archiving in the public interest for community archive groups. Include this in your participation agreement. Do not rely on consent as your legal basis, as consent can be withdrawn at any time under GDPR rules. Explain the legal basis for processing personal information and the interviewee's rights. This can be done in many ways, such as a link to a privacy policy on your website, the text on the participation agreement form, or a link to an email address where they can contact you. A comprehensive guide to ethics in oral history is available on the Oral History Society website. Contact the Oral History Society if you have any particular inquiries regarding personal data. There may be occasions when you wish to interview a minor or a vulnerable adult, for example, someone who has a learning difficulty or who lives with some degree of physical or cognitive impairment. In this case, make sure you have a safeguarding policy in place to protect their health, safety and rights before you interview them. You may need the assistance of a gatekeeper. This could be an interviewee's relative, friend or carer. A gatekeeper can help the interviewee to understand their interview process and their rights in a way that will be more accessible to them. Again, contact the Oral History Society if you have any inquiries regarding safeguarding. You should give a participation agreement to the interviewee for their approval before the recording takes place. The participation agreement should set out criteria for how the recording will be kept and used by the community archive and by researchers. It should also state that the interviewee will be asked permission for any intended use that falls outside of these criteria. It should inform the interviewee how their personal information may be used and shared by the community archive group. It should inform the interviewee that they have control over which parts of the interview will be made public and that no content that may cause them damage or distress will be made available. Both parties should sign copies of the agreement before the interview takes place and each party should keep one of these copies. Once the interview has been completed, the interviewee will need to sign a recording agreement. The recording agreement assigns copyright of the interview to the community archive. Whilst your community archive owns the copyright to the recording, the copyright of the spoken words will initially lie with the interviewee. The recording agreement will give them the option to agree to sign this copyright to you. This will give you more control over how the interview is used. Even if the interviewee signs over their copyright, you should still give them the chance to list any sections of the interview they would like to keep closed for a designated period of time. You can download example participation and recording agreements from the Community Archives Toolkit on the Norfolk Record Office website. Before you arrive, ensure other members of your group know where you are and have your contact details so that they can contact you if necessary. Also make sure the interviewee has someone who knows who you are, why you are meeting them, and where and when you are conducting the interview. Keep an audit trail of correspondence between you and the interviewee. If you have not met the interviewee in person before, take some form of ID with you. The selected recording room should be quiet and not facing a busy road. Ensure that all TVs, radios, ticking clocks and mobile phones are switched off or on silent. Make sure that you are not likely to be disturbed by other occupants of the house, visitors or pets. Remember, interviewees may be nervous or apprehensive about being interviewed by a stranger, even if it takes place within their own home. Being calm, patient, relaxed and polite will help put them at ease and is likely to result in a better interview. Before you start, agree to build a couple of breaks into the interview for rest and refreshment. Talking for an extensive period of time will get tiring for the participant. 
You may also need to consider impromptu breaks if the interviewer becomes upset by some of the things they are talking about. For all breaks, press pause rather than stop on the recorder to avoid finishing the recording and having to start a new one. After the interview, thank them for their time and ask them how they found it. Bringing up memories is sometimes traumatic for participants. Ensure that they have understood, agreed to and signed the participation agreement and the recording agreement and that they are still happy for the interview to be made public. Re-establish which sections, if any, they would prefer to be closed. Before you leave, make sure they have your contact details and that you have agreed a date, time and location for any follow-up interviews. It's a good idea to send the interviewee a copy of the audio recording in their preferred format so that they have a record of what they have said. Sometimes you may consider having more than one interviewer or participant. With more than one interviewer, one can focus on asking the questions and one could be responsible for the recording equipment and the administrative elements. Be sure to let the interviewee know how many people to expect. Having more than one participant, especially if they are already friends or acquaintances, can be useful as it may make the interviewees less nervous and the conversation may flow more naturally with both participants contributing and expanding on or clarifying what each other are saying. Bear in mind, this may make the recording slightly harder to follow as people may talk over each other and each speaker will need to be identified in the summary or the transcript. There are some key points that you'll need to cover in each interview. This will be useful for people who later catalogue and listen to the oral history recordings. At the beginning of the recording, state your, the interviewer's name, the interviewee's name, the interviewee themselves can state this, the date, time and place that the interview is being recorded. Do not be too specific as it is being recording in the interviewee's home. The first points that need to be covered in the interview are context, so the reason why this person is being interviewed. For example, we're here today to talk about Mrs Bridges' experience of growing up in Market Langthwaite and her career as a teacher. And the interviewee's date and place of birth. Exact details are not needed, just the year and town or village name. It's generally a good idea to not overplan your interview questions, as too much preparation and rehearsal can make the conversation stilted. Here are some tips for keeping interviews flowing. Pick a maximum of four or five topics that you really want to know about and let the interviewee know them in advance so they can prepare and collect their thoughts. The topics should be the key reasons why you want to interview a particular person. Examples could include their working lives, skills and experiences, relationship with the local area and their involvement with local political parties, charities, clubs or societies. Interviewees generally find it easier to remember the details of their life chronologically. So think about structuring the interview to take in their early family life first before moving on to education, career and relationships. Keep the questions open ended. Avoid those that could produce yes or no answers. For example, rather than saying, was this your next job? Say, tell me about your next job. Avoid asking leading questions. Keep your questions as neutral as you can. This will ensure you get the story as the interviewer intends it to be told and avoids any preconceptions. For example, rather than saying, was that a difficult experience for you? Try asking, how did that experience make you feel? Try not to get too involved. Let the interviewees speak for themselves so that their memories and personalities are the focus of the conversation. Any further questions should simply be prompts or follow-ups to find out more about interesting subjects. For example, what did you think of that? Or why did you decide to move there? Or when did that come to an end? Remember, the interviewee is the focus. Never correct the interviewee or disagree with them. Try not to interrupt them. Wait for a pause before you ask a question. You can use visual cues instead of audible ones to encourage and show that you're listening. Make eye contact. Respond with body language like nodding and smiling rather than saying, mm, aha, uh -huh, and really. Keep on topic as much as possible and avoid switching too quickly between subjects. You don't necessarily have to cover every topic in one go. An interviewee may find extensive interviewing tiring. 
use a notepad to jot down subject areas you want to go back to later on. If you feel you haven't fully covered everything you wanted to, suggest scheduling a follow-up session. Here is a brief exercise. We have a list of potential interview questions. Have a think about which questions are good and which questions may need improvement. At the end of this presentation, we will have some answers to discuss. It is vital that you record your interview. It's impossible to write down exactly what an interviewee is saying at the time. The best you could hope for is a general summary. An audio recording captures exactly what has been said and also captures an interviewee's accent, dialect and quirks of speech. Recordings must be made in the best possible quality using specialist recording equipment. They will be unique historical sources and so need to be easily heard and understood by future researchers. Aim to get the best possible equipment that your budget allows to ensure high quality and long term preservation, but also be mindful of what your interviewers will be comfortable using. Oral history recordings can be audio only or audio visual. However, whilst video obviously provides a valuable record of the way a person looks, do bear in mind that videoing interviews requires more expensive equipment and may potentially need an extra person to set up and operate the video camera. People can find cameras intrusive and off-putting and audiovisual files will also take up much more storage space than audio only ones. Therefore, the Norfolk Record Office advises that recordings be audio only. However, if you wish to showcase some visual material, for example, showing off photographs, you may find a short video clip is also useful. Using a hybrid approach, you could perhaps focus on a short section of the interview that is particularly relevant and rerun it on a video at a slight significant location or with objects to talk about which make use of the visual aspect. You may also wish to photograph the participant with their consent and or digitise relevant documents to provide some context to the interview. There are many different types of portable audio recording equipment and ways of capturing and storing the recordings. Technology is constantly changing and improving, so it's a good idea to keep an eye on developments and to contact the experts at the Oral History Society for advice. You can also post equipment inquiries to the Norfolk Archives Network Forum. You will need a digital recorder that can make stereo recordings in an uncompressed high quality PCM WAV or .WAV files. An MP3 might sound fine, but it's not good for archival preservation. Aim for the following settings, a sample frequency of 44 to 96 kilohertz and a bit depth, which means how detailed the sound recording is, of 16 to 24. The recorder should be powered both by cable and by batteries if possible. This is a safeguard to prevent the recorder running out of power midway through your interview. Using a power bank is a good alternative to connecting to main supply and means you don't have to be near a socket. The recorder should ideally have sockets for two external microphones, one for the interviewee and one for yourself. However, the internal microphone is usually sufficient. You may also need a tabletop tripod to support the recorder, some batteries and or a power cable or bank to reduce the risk of the recorder's power running out, a memory card to store the digital recordings prior to transfer to a computer, this may not come with the recorder, so check this in advance and buy the appropriate type of memory card that is required separately. The memory card will slot into the recorder and once the recording has finished can be transferred to the computer. You might want a set of headphones. These will be useful for immediately checking the audio quality of the recordings. A windshield microphone cover if you're recording outdoors. An audio editing software, which can be found for free online. We'll showcase Audacity audio editing software later in the session. Smartphones are not recommended for recording interviews. The file quality will be greatly reduced and phone storage and battery are minimal compared to other options. Phones are also easily lost or stolen, which could jeopardize the interview's confidentiality. However, if you wish to interview someone as a priority and no other technology is available, then smartphones can be used as a last resort. Ensure the audio files are transferred to a computer or hard drive as soon as possible after a recording has taken place. Once you've completed an interview, 
upload the recording for digital storage as soon as possible, make backup copies and save them in different locations. It's useful to maintain a folder on your computer and other digital storage areas for each interviewee. An interviewee's folder should include a document listing the interviewee's full name, date of birth, the place and date of the interview, the interviewer's name, and the equipment used to make the recording, the signed participation and recording agreements, any email correspondence between the interviewer and the interviewee, a time-coded text summary of the interview, a preservation or master copy of the recording, which should be of the highest possible quality, an access copy of the recording, Access copies are lower in sound quality, but are much smaller and easier to share with researchers. They are usually created in MP3 format. Keep copies in at least one further location. In total, you should have one preservation copy plus at least one access copy. If you're using hard drives for your storage, make sure you check these regularly to ensure they're still working. Ask the interviewee if they would like an MP3 copy of the interview or a summary of it in a format convenient to them. This will allow them to go through what they have said and flag up any sections that they would like to be temporarily closed. If this is the case, you can then edit the access version of the interview to remove these sections and remove the relevant text from the summary. Create a catalogue record for each recording and include the following information date of interview, the file names, the file paths for the preservation and access copies, these should not be made available to the public, a basic title for the recording, for example, interview of John Davies of Market Langthwaite about his life and career by Ian Watkin. Include an interview summary which goes in the description field, here you would also note the start and end time codes of any redacted content in your access copy, and then the time periods and topics discussed, for example, 1940s or manufacturing, which could go in your subject fields. It's a good idea to hold on to all the information from each interview, also known as metadata or data about data. Keep it in a spreadsheet and you can use this to help fill in your catalogue entries later on. This is an example created by the Oral History Society. Here you can see all the information associated with the interviewee. Name, year of birth, gender, occupation, then information associated with the interviewer, and then details of the recording. Date of recording, location, type of recording, length of recording, equipment used, and notes. Scro scrolling along, the spreadsheet continues with space to record the file names, access and copyright details, and note any accompanying documentation, such as a summary, a transcript, or any scans of relevant archive documents like photographs. Summaries are important for cataloguing oral histories as they can be used in the description field of a catalog entry to list the topics covered in the interview. This will be useful if researchers are looking for sections to include in a book, documentary or exhibition, for example. Summarise the interview by topic and write a sentence for each one with a time code in square brackets. This will help researchers find what they want to listen to quickly. Generally, it will take around two working hours to summarise one recorded hour. When writing your descriptions, think about the words a researcher would use to search. For instance, an interviewee might speak at length about lack of food after the war, but not actually mention the words rationing or World War II itself. An example summary with time codes could look like this. It covers the introductory info on who is being interviewed, early life in market length weight and family relationships, school, rationing after World War II, leaving school, teacher training and life in Norwich in the 50s, return to market length weight as teacher, and stories about particular lessons and children. In the last section, we've noted that a portion of the recording is muted because of sensitive content. This is something you can do to your access copies with audio editing software. When listening through the recording in full to create your summary, 
you should also be carrying out a sensitivity review of what's been said and watch out for any special category data that might need to be edited out for public access. Special category data is sensitive personal data about an identifiable living individual. It includes data revealing or concerning race or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious and philosophical beliefs, corporate or industry information, medical or health related issues, sex life or sexuality, gossip or rumour. This is particularly important if you're publishing online. Having a takedown policy on your website is not strong enough under GDPR. Recordings must be assessed for sensitive content where its release would likely cause substantial damage and distress to those individuals. So be vigilant to third party references. If you're providing access in a controlled setting, you can always get users of the recording to sign agreements not to use any sensitive information which you may have missed. It's advisable to add into the notes field in your catalogue not to provide copies of recordings which have sensitive content unless a sensitivity review and redaction has taken place. Further information on data protection can be found on the Oral History Society website. Here is an example of a sensitivity review form produced by the Oral History Society, which you can use to note down details of what sensitive content has been recorded and what decisions have been made around its use. Multiple people in your group should review the recording to add their input. Once you have agreed on sections to be closed, you can record this decision in the form. You can use this form to record the collection name, interview reference number, an interviewee name, and then the track or file name, time codes, and the detail of sensitive content, as well as the dates and authors of each review and what decision was taken. There are many examples of audio editing software. Some are free and open source, meaning you can download them straight onto your computer, but it's good to do some research into the best options. You can use them to tidy up the recording if there were interruptions, join separate files together, pull out sound bites, or mute sections which should be closed for public access. I'm going to show you a video tutorial on how to use Audacity, which is one of the most popular examples of audio editing software. So I'm going to show you an example of audio editing software. So this is Audacity. Uh, there are many different types of audio editing software, however, Audacity is one of the most popular as it's very user friendly and can also be open on a PC or a Mac. So in front of us, we've got um, the dashboard with a track of audio recording on it. So the blue waves represent the sound levels. So when the sound is silent, you'll see it's just a straight line. Uh, and when the louder the noise, the wider the waves will be on the image so you can kind of get a visual sense of the recording. I'm going to play this through for you so you can get an idea of some of the issues you might have um, with an interview recording. So tell me about how you came to live in Norwich. So around about 2016 time I was looking to do um, a course in occupational therapy, a master's course, and um, I was looking at places that ran this course, not everywhere has it, um, and the University of East Anglia was one place that ran this course. So I, I, I kind of knew Notch a little bit, I grew up in Cambridge, so, um, oh sorry, do you mind, that's the door, <laughs> sorry about that, is that okay? So there are a few issues that came up. First of all, uh, you had lots of ums and ahs within the recording, which you may wish to remove just to make for a smoother listening experience. Um, and also at the end of the recording, uh, there was a knock on the door which interrupted the conversation and you might want to remove that from the final edit. So I'm gonna show you some examples of how to get rid of the ums and ahs. So if we go back through and we can find one of them, so tell me about how you came to live in Norwich. So around about 2016 time, I was looking to do um, a... So you can see there was an um here. So if we select and drag the mouse across that to highlight it, 
And then if you go to the scissor icon here, which is the cut function, if you click on that, and that will crop out the um, the um. Let's see if we can find some more. Course in occupational therapy, a master's course, and um. So here was another um here. So if we select that and do the same, I was looking at places that ran this course. Not everywhere has it, um, and. There's another um there. And the University of East Anglia was one place that ran this course. So I, I, I kind of knew Notch a little bit. I grew up in Cambridge, so... Um, oh. And there was an um just at the end here. So we've removed those from the final recording. So you have the interviewer's voice at the beginning asking a question and also an interruption with a door knock at the end. So you may want to remove those from the final recording as well. So how you do that is first of all, if you go back to the beginning, find out where those um, pieces of audio that you want to remove are. So tell me about how you came to live in Norwich. So so you can see that section there is the interviewer's voice. And then if we go towards the end. Oh, sorry. Do you mind? That's the door. <laughs> sorry about that. Is that OK? So you can see that the audio of the door knock starts here. So you might want to remove both of those. So to do that, if you select the audio that you want to keep. And then if you click on trim audio outside collection, you'll see that removes the extraneous audio from the recording. So if we go back and play. Around about 2016 time, I was looking to do a um, course in occupational therapy, a master's course. And I was looking at places that ran this course, not everywhere has it. And the University of East Anglia was one place that ran this course. So I, I, I kind of knew Notch a little bit. I grew up in Cambridge, so. Uh... So as you can hear, it sounds a lot smoother with the ums and ahs removed. And also um, you've removed the extraneous audio from the beginning and end of the recording. So say that there was a section of the interview that the interviewee wanted to remain closed for a certain amount of time. For example, she didn't want anyone to know where she went to university. So in this case, we could select that piece of audio and mute it so that in the final access version, it does not um, display. So if we go back and find the section of the recording uh, to be muted, and the University of East Anglia was one place that ran this. So you can see the audio appears around here. We can always go back and check it. And the University of East Anglia was one place that ran this. So this section here is to be removed. So then if you select silence audio selection, and you can see that's now been muted. So if we go back and play the whole audio again. Around about 2016 time, I was looking to do a um, course in occupational therapy, a master's course. And I was looking at places that ran this course. Not everywhere has it. And there was one place that ran this course. So I, I, I kind of knew Notch a little bit. I grew up in Cambridge, so. Uh... So as you can see, uh, that has now been muted and is inaudible to people listening to the recording. I'll quickly show you some other functions of Audacity. You've obviously got play, pause and stop. Um, you can also skip back to the start of the recording and stick to the end. You can also zoom into the recording. So if there's a piece of audio 
uh, that you wish to focus on a bit more closely so just remove some background noise it's easier to see where the audio is so if you wanted to add the recording to an exhibition you may want to add music tracks to the background or um, put effects on the um, on the recording you can do that using the effects um, column here and add in any of these special effects to the recording so that's just a brief run through of what you can do with audacity um, as you can see it's fairly user friendly um, so do give it a try and feel free to let us know how you get on with it just to say it's up to you whether you take out the ums and ahs you may only wish to do this for a 30 second clip to put on your website for example you don't have to necessarily do this for the entire interview. Remember to keep the preservation copy unedited. You should also consider the interviewee's moral rights. You shouldn't alter the meaning of what they're saying by editing their words. For example, taking out the word not in the sentence, I was not happy living there, would completely change what they're trying to say. Full verbatim transcription of a recording is very time consuming. A standard guide is around six hours of transcription per hour of recording, and that's for professional transcribers. Often a summary of the recording is all you will need. But if you do want to transcribe sections of an interview or the whole thing, there are software packages that make things a little easier. The Oral History Society recommends ExpressScribe transcription software. You can use this to control the speed of the playback and rewind sections using keyboard keys or a foot pedal. There's also been improvements with automatic transcription software where you upload your recording and get a transcript back. There are different offerings available online and this topic has been posted on on the Norfolk Archives Network forum. If you're interested in voice to text transcription, just be aware of the organisation's small print and their rights over the recordings you upload. They are getting better at understanding accents, but we've had reports from some groups that the Norfolk accent doesn't always come out quite right. Even with automatic transcription, there will need to be an element of quality checking and editing. It's a good idea to try and reproduce an interview syntax, which is the structure of their speech. This can preserve their thought processes and show how they go about answering your questions. It can capture the interview's personality and make the transcript less dry. If you are recording an interview with the aim of preserving the interviewee's dialect or accent, you may think about describing their way of speaking. This can sometimes be tricky as trying to capture an authentic dialect may result in the transcript being difficult to read. If the interviewer has the same accent or dialect as the interviewee, they may write a word or phrase without capturing it in the dialect form. For example, if someone pronounces beer as bear in the Norfolk accent, someone with the same accent would still write it as beer. Someone from outside that region may try to reproduce what they see in as an authentic pronunciation, which then may be confusing to readers. Also, some interviewees may not want their exact spoken words reproduced as they may feel this can be used to mock or demean them. Generally, it's better to not correct grammar or attempt to spell in a manner that reflects the dialect. This way, you will keep the flavour of the interviewee's speaking style without trying to attempt their way of speaking. Now we come to the checklist for oral history. To start with, draw up a plan for your oral history programme, including why you want to conduct interviews, who you want to interview, and what you will do with the recordings. Ensure you have recording equipment that fits the standard required for a high quality sound recording and that you have procedures in place for uploading, storing, copying and cataloguing the recording. Make a list of subjects you want to cover and people who may be able to interview about these subjects. Contact these people and explain what the interview is for. Ask the interviewee for initial information on their life and career and do research into the topic so you are well prepared for the interview. Plan the interview, including where and when it will take place. Put in place any ethical measures that will be required and ensure that the interviewee has informed consent over how their interviews will be recorded, used and shared. 
make sure the interviewee reads and signs a participation agreement prior to the interview. Maintain good interview etiquette during the recording. Ask open-ended and neutral questions and allow for breaks. On completion, ask the interviewee to sign a recording agreement and send them an audio copy of the recording. Check whether they would like any part of the interview to be closed. Upload, name and store the interview files in multiple locations. Create a summary and do a sensitivity review. Make any access copies you need and edit these, not the preservation copy. Catalogue the recordings and any associated documentation for future reference. And you can create a transcript if you have the time or the inclination. The Oral History Society, based at the British Library, includes useful in-depth advice on their website. It's also a good source of practical training. We recommend checking their website as your first port of call for any questions about oral history projects. You can also visit the Friends of Norfolk Dialect website, which provides a very useful glossary of Norfolk dialect words that could help with understanding and using dialect for summary and transcription work. Thank you very much for watching. There's an in-depth reference section on oral history on our Community Archives Toolkit, which you can find via the Norfolk Record Office website. Take a look at the Norfolk Archives Network Forum to connect with other Community Archive groups. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us via the forum. We have a short feedback survey and a link beneath this video. This is really helpful for us to pass information on to the National Literary Heritage Fund. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes, if you could please click on the link and fill it out, it would be much appreciated. Thank you again for watching. Here we have some answers to the interview questions exercise. Question A. This is a leading question that may steer the interviewer in a particular direction. You could ask instead, how did you find that job? Question B, this is too broad a question and the participant may not know where to begin. Focus on specific aspects of childhood, such as friends, school or activities. Question C, you may need to expand upon this question as it might lead to a simple answer of the date. Question D, be aware that this person could bring in opinions about current issues or residents. Be careful of the mention of third parties, as personal opinions about identifiable individuals count as a breach of data protection rules. Question E. Don't contradict the interviewee. They are telling you their memories and they're not infallible. It may damage the relationship with them if you infer that they are not telling you the truth. Question F. Again, this is a very broad question. If you're not specific with your questions, an interviewee might get flummoxed and not know where to begin. Question G. This is a leading question. Ask instead, how did that make you feel? As in question H. Question I. Rephrase this to, why do you think they did that? The interviewee can't say for sure why someone else did something. Question J. This is fine, although you may want to rephrase the question as, what did that role entail? Question K. Don't put words in the interviewee's mouth. Again, you can ask them how they felt. Question L. This may come across as rude or dismissive. If the interviewee is going off topic and you want to move along, find an opportunity gap in the conversation and ask, I'd like to go back to, or that's great, can you please tell me more about?